In the last video, we discussed some of the Watchtower's objections to the Trinity Doctrine, and specifically looked at portions of their book called Reasoning from the Scriptures. She quoted several sources that the Watchtower uses to suggest that Trinitarian theology is a 4th century invention. I explained to her how historically that isn't true. Listen to how she diverts instead of responding directly. It's not as cut and dry as there was no such thing as the Trinity until this, you know, Rome got together and said, let's make it up. You know, there's that that's a not a very um, accurate view of well, uh, how it happened. Uh, you see, the, the, the Trinity was not sure the Trinity was around in pagan cultures. At the time of the conversation, I didn't fully grasp how she was switching to a different subject instead of dealing with what I was saying. I can hear it now. The Watchtower strings those select portions of quotes together, especially with the New Catholic Encyclopedia, to try and make a case that there was no such thing as the Trinity until the Council of Nicaea in 325. That's why I was pointing out the early church fathers like Clement of Rome and Ignatius of Antioch. They, along with many others, clearly disprove what the Watchtower was trying to suggest. On their website, I did find a page where they have some references to Clement and Ignatius, with some select quotes from them, but again, only to try and suggest that they weren't Trinitarian. But if you actually read their works for yourself, in context, you will quickly see how ridiculous the Watchtower's claim is. That was the point I was trying to make. Then she diverted to the idea that the Trinity is an old pagan doctrine that existed long before, and I tried, probably in vain, to help her see the doctrine of the Trinity is quite different from pagan triads. It's frustrating to listen to, but I think also a helpful example that shows how indoctrinated she is. She's not even hearing me as I'm telling her about the historic Orthodox doctrine because it contradicts what the Watchtower says it is. But that's a no. The tr okay, that's but, the whole problem. Well, here's okay, but you see, but let me just finish. You know, when the Babylonians captured Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and of course they went into captivity. Yeah. And of course, all those all those Babylonians with different religions, they all had many gods. Right. And they 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 had many gods, but they had three gods that were superior and they were one. Right. Yes, they had three gods. So that's a triad, not a trinity. Yeah, they Very different. Which triad? Trinity? No, they're not the same thing at all. That's the problem, is that if you assume those are the same thing, then you're still not understanding what, can, what I'm can saying. Can you explain the difference between the word triad and trinity? So the triad, you're talking about three gods, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about three head gods amongst many gods. But anyway, even if there wasn't any other gods, three gods. Three separate gods. That is not the Trinity. No, they don't. They, but they say three gods in one. They see three gods connected, but they're three gods. And you keep saying that too about the Trinity, but that is not the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is that God is one God. But yet you, yet you worship of, God, Jesus, and right, you worship the Holy right, Spirit. Right, because the one God consists of three co-equal, co-eternal persons who consist of the one which, being of which God. Is triad. No, it's not triad. It's trinity. It's different. That's what I'm trying to, you know, you may disagree with it, but I'm hoping I can help you understand the differences. I don't believe in three gods. Well, you're not, you, you, you see that, like, don't, uh, I don't want to uh, um, sound like I'm being, being unreasonable or contradictory, but... The, the Pope can't even uh, explain the Trinity. Uh, no, but uh, I don't believe the Pope is a Christian. The, the Archbishop of Canterbury can't explain the Trinity. No, I don't believe he's a Christian either. I probably could have responded a little differently in this circumstance because the issue with Rome and its teachings is more complicated than we needed to get into in this discussion. So I'll go on record right now and say that I do believe there are some born-again believers in the Roman Catholic Church, though I don't think that's very common. And the Holy Spirit would lead them out of Rome as they are sanctified and come to recognize the false teachings they are being subjected to. But mainly I want to comment on the issue of Roman Catholics defining the Trinity. 
I honestly don't know if the Pope or the Archbishop of Canterbury can accurately define the Trinity, but the Roman Catholic Church throughout history has held to an orthodox view of the doctrine, so it's entirely possible that they could, at least in theory, define the doctrine properly if asked. So I shouldn't have made such strong comments at this point. I think I mostly just wanted her to remember that I'm not Roman Catholic and not interested in defending them. Well, who's a Christian then? A Christian is one who has been saved and transformed and regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit through the hearing of the gospel and coming to Christ and surrendering and submitting and confessing and repenting and turning to him and being transformed into a new creation. Well, those I'm sure the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Pope believe they are, too. No, oh, and I think they probably do, some of them. They may or may not think that, but they would certainly say that. But when you look at what they actually teach and the way they behave, I don't see any evidence that they're Christians. I agree with them in the way they behave, but uh, but certainly uh, there's... But that doesn't... Uh, that's neither here nor there, because, uh, you know, like Paul said... People under that uh, that are not under the law do as uh, do as do as the law, you know. So so even those who don't believe right. in any god, yeah, do good, you yeah. know. So sure. that's beside the point, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I, when I look at yeah, there's a lot. Actually, if you, yeah, <laughs> we could get into a whole discussion about the Reformation. You know, that's and, a yeah, that's a, that's another can of worms, which I love to talk about. I love talking about the Reformation and the issues. I mean, I have a dear Catholic friend, and I like to talk with her about it sometimes too. And but, uh, but yeah, that's that's another whole. No, I, I don't see. Um, I know it's it, it's 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 a really deep within you. It's and it's a real sincere thought within you, and I know you're very sincere. And I know you are too. I agree. And yeah. uh, and that and that's what what I have to. I want to pick my words very carefully. <laughs> Uh, because okay, yeah. I know that you're very sincere, and I know that in, deep down in your heart, you that's really what you believe, you know. And I yeah. and and I I want to I want to honor that in you, you know. So, and I appreciate that, but I also want you to know that I know we disagree on a lot of these things, and that I think we both agree that you and I belong to two different religions, and so it's okay for you to, to say things that, you know, about me or my faith or whatever that, you know, if you don't believe that I am a Christian, you don't, you know, anything like that, you, you're welcome to say that kind of thing. And it, you know, it doesn't have an effect on my salvation. So I, I just want you to know, you can be open about that. You know, like you don't have to feel like you're walking on eggshells around me either. So, but I, you know, when I do hear things that I, I need to correct, then I, I, I want to do that. I'm hoping we can just keep on trying to communicate and understand each other. You see, I always go back to to the basic the the basic cornerstone of that should be a faith, and that is the fact that there the faith has to be true, and true, there's only one truth. Absolutely, agreed. Yeah. So I mean, was there anything from you know scratch like that? Faith has to be true. Yeah. And faith has to be reasonable. This is an interesting comment that I've heard from witnesses a number of times. Honestly, it's not a comment I would specifically use to describe saving faith. I would say first and foremost that it is a gift of God, as we read in Ephesians 2. While certainly our minds are very much engaged when it comes to faith, the word reasonable can mean a lot of different things. If you have a false framework placed over the Bible, for instance, what comes across as reasonable to you would not be at all reasonable to anyone else who does not use that false framework. For instance, they believe that they are what the Watchtower calls the great crowd who can never see heaven or be in the presence of God, and that there is a literal 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses who do reside in heaven with God and have Jesus as their mediator. This is based on Rutherford's two-class system from 1935. That framework is what they use to reason so many of their other beliefs. I could give many other examples, but I think you get the idea. Faith has to correspond with the Bible. Mm -hmm. 
and it it was inspired by God, and that's the beauty of the, about, about the Bible, because you know, like over centuries, it has been it has been trying to change, you know, the trans the transcription of it to bolster an individual's faith. You know the the writer's faith. You know the transcriber's faith. But by ta you know, for example, by taking out uh, Jehovah's name, confusing as to who that passage is referring to sometimes. So, but when you cross reference scripture, that missing can't be distorted, and that's the beauty of how Jehovah composed the Bible. So, okay, so you, we both agree that Scripture is God-breathed, um, but do you believe that he didn't preserve it for a long time very well? 